All right, we're going to be in a book that I love to always read, and I can't wait to someday preach. Obviously, not right now, but someday soon, I would love to preach through the book of First and Second Chronicles, just because I feel like nobody ever goes to First or Second Chronicles. You get through First and Second Kings, and you're like, well, I'm good. I don't need to know this, all of this information verbatim all over again, but I would suggest that First and Second Chronicles has a unique theme, but we're not really going to get into that. We're just going to discuss a life from um, the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 33. Second Chronicles, near the end, 33. Uh, Chronicles is, is I, I think it's pretty cool. In the Hebrew canon, actually, they put it at the very end of the Old Testament. So they're giving this big summation of history and hope at the very end of their Bibles. And of course, Chronicles is looking forward to the true son of David. It keeps searching for the son of David and can't find him, but it is expectant all the way from Adam to the exile for the son of David who will fulfill all the promises of God. But that's first and second Chronicles. Um, but we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about uh, one of these kings, these Judean kings. Uh, Chronicles deals with Judah more than it does with Israel, or really even the prophets, but it does handle the prophets. But first and second Kings deals more with Judah and Israel and the relationship to the prophets. Chronicles is is more about Judah exclusively, and we're going to be in 2 Chronicles 33. Uh, We're going to be talking about King Manasseh. King Manasseh. I would give him the nickname of the Ahab of the South. So if you know your Bibles, you know that that's a bad thing. Um, The Ahab of the South, his name... Nice. His name, uh, Manasseh, means cause to forget. Now, if you remember in Genesis, uh, Joseph was brought into Egypt. He was sold into slavery by his brothers, and he for a while thought that he was forgotten by his family. And many griefs followed him, but then as you remember, he got elevated in Pharaoh's house, and then he had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, And he named Manasseh, Manasseh, because he said, the Lord has caused me to forget all of my suffering. So it was a positive thing, right? The Lord has been gracious to me and and has been so gracious and abundantly good to me that I have forgotten my suffering. Well, it was an important name in Israel. Even a, a tribe was named after it. Part of the land allotment went to Manasseh and East Manasseh. But now we have a king named Manasseh. And it's kind of an ironic name because, as you will soon see, Manasseh, King Manasseh, caused all of Judah to forget the Lord their God. His grandfather was Ahaz, a bad, bad king. His parents were Hezekiah and Hephzibah. That was his mom's mother's name. He was probably born late into the life of Hezekiah, and that's interesting because that probably means that Hezekiah and his wife were barren for a long period of their time. Um, He would father Amon, and then he'd be the grandfather of King Josiah. Maybe just turn off that computer. Uh, No, good job, Andrew. Keep it up. Uh, In, of course, critically, if you look in Matthew 1, chapter 10, or chapter 1, verse 10, you see that Manasseh is in the family history of Jesus himself. So here we have someone who has huge importance to the storyline of the Bible. But what kind of a king was he? Spoiler spoiler alert, he was a bad, bad king. He was the Ahab of the south, a bad, bad guy. How do we know when a king is really bad? How do we know that a king is really, really bad? Well, you kind of pick up hints and pieces even from the way the Bible introduces the king. Turn over, for example, to Second Chronicles chapter 1 and look for two things as we look at these kings, these lists of these kings. Look, uh, first off, for the pattern of life that they followed and also the years of their reign. Okay, So this is kind of the, the narrator's hints, as you were, as you... Uh, for like what kind of a king this guy was, just summing it up at the very beginning of his, of his reign. So here we have a king named Jehoram 
in 2 Chronicles 21. You see it there. And then you jump down to verse 5. Look at this. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem, and he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. That's the northern um, uh, nation of Israel. Just as the house of Ahab had done, for Ahab's daughter was his wife, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. How long did he reign? This is, this is, this is uh, classroom interaction. Eight years, that's right. Was he a good, good king? No, why? Who, who did he walk in? Whose footsteps did he follow? Who? Can you hear? Ahab, Ahab his father? In law, that's right. So Ahab was the king of the north, one of the worst kings in northern Israel's history. And notice this guy. His father is Jehoshaphat, which, who was a pretty good king. But Jehoshaphat makes a marriage alliance with Ahab, and now Ahab's daughter is married to his son, the crown prince. What a stupid idea. But anyway, um, notice he is walking in the paths of Ahab because your wife shapes you. Uh, let's turn over to chapter 22. You notice another king, Ahaziah. Ahaziah then reigns. You see this in verse 2. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah. Remember, she's the, grand, she's the granddaughter of Omri. That means she's the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. And he also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab for his mother, was his counselor to do wicked. How long did he reign? One year. It's actually, this is actually one of the most dramatic points, I would say, in Kings or Chronicles. This king, uh, this king right here, the, 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 the promise of the Davidic king is almost on a thread here because there's this, there's this, um, there's this mother, this mother that's trying to take over the kingdom, and she effectively do, almost does it. But of course, the Lord's sovereign over. Uh, what, uh, what, what are the footsteps that Ahaziah walks in? Who, who, who is he following? Who is he pattering his life after? Ahab, right? Okay, you get the, you get the hint here. You can kind of see, right? Where we kind of know who's going to be bad, who's going to be good. Let's go over to another king, uh, Joash. Joash in in Second Chronicles twenty four. 24, 1 through 2, Joash, we see, is, was seven years old when he became king. So there's a lot of pandemonium in the, the country between these two chapters. And he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. Whoa, wait a minute here. His mother's name was uh, Zibiah from Beersheba. And Joash did what was right in the sight of Yahweh all the days of uh, Jehoiada the priest. So how long did he reign? How long did he reign? 40 years. Well, that's a pretty long reign, right? And notice, notice the connection. Was he a good king or a bad king? Good king. Uh, according to, to what standard? Who was he following? Who? In the sight of Yahweh. But notice, notice it's very important. All the days of Jehoiada, the priest. And there's a cool story here of Jehoiada kind of protecting Joash and kind of making him, making him king. But then the narrator goes on to say, as soon as Jehoiada dies, Joash turned in pride to his own wisdom. But let's, let's just say, okay, so he was mostly good. And then we have Am- Amaziah in 25, 2 Chronicles 25. Uh, 25, 1 through 2 says, Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Je- oh boy. Jehoadan of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of Yahweh, yet not with his whole heart. That's Amaziah. So, once again, 29 years, but notice, he did what was right, but not with his whole heart. What, what, what's, what's that talking about? Well, the, the chapter will go on to talk about how he, he seeks to worship other gods. He, he, he's wondering, wow, Look at this impressive, uh, this impressive altar that these other nations have. I want one like that. Verse 15, the anger of Yahweh burned again in Amaziah, and he sent him a prophet and said to him, Why have you sought the gods of the people who have not delivered their own people from their hand? Now it happened that as he was talking with him, the king said to him, 
Have we given you to be a royal counselor? Stop. Why should you be struck down? Then the prophet stopped and said, I know that God has counseled to destroy you because you have done this and have not listened to my counsel. He was a good king, but he didn't like prophets that said bad news to him. That is Amaziah. But then we turn from him to Uzziah. Uzziah, of course, this is where the prophet Isaiah first received his calling in the days of Uzziah. But notice here about Uzziah 26, 26, 3 through 4. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king. He reigned how many years? 52 years. So this is the longest longest reign by far so far. In Jerusalem, his mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. He did what was right in the sight of Yahweh according to all that his father Amaziah had done. Now, once again, Amaziah is a mixed bag, right? He didn't do it with his whole heart. But notice here, he was still a standard of righteousness. This was still a guy that, that, wa- that was right in the sight of Yahweh. So Uzziah was a good king, <coughs> at least until he tried to be a priest. But we don't have enough, to talk about, enough time to talk about that. Let, let's go over to Second Chronicles 27. And Jotham was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did what was right in the sight of Yahweh, according to all that his father Uzziah had done. However, he did not enter the temple of Yahweh. That's talking about Uzziah. But notice here, the people continued acting corruptly. Okay, so here we have a guy that reigned for 16 years. And notice, he follows the pattern of his father, right? It's a good thing. He's right in the sight of the Lord, but notice the people are beginning to not care about whose king is in charge. They're going to do their own thing. But that leads us to Ahaz in 28. Ahaz, of course, is the grandfather of the man we're talking about. In 28 1, it says Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did what was uh, he did not do what was right in the sight of Yahweh as David his father had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and also made molten images for the Baals. Okay, so he's he's a king that has reigned for 16 years. And then notice he once again follows after the kings of Israel. Um, Influence matters, right? Influence matters. That's the whole story of Chronicles, that influence is a powerful thing. And, and this is kind of interesting. Notice how desperate Ahaz is in his idolatry. 20, 28 verse 23. Look at this. He sacrificed to the gods of Damascus, which had struck him, and said, because the gods of the kings of Aram helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. Here's the logic of idolatry, right? That nation beat me, therefore I'm going to pursue that nation. Now the, the irony is kings in the past, um, like Amaziah, they defeated nations and still longed for their kind of idol worship. But, but here's the basic logic, right? Uh, we see in Ahaz at, light, at least, I am going to try to find the God that wins, and I'm going to worship and serve that God. But that takes us to Hezekiah in chapter 29, Hezekiah is a good king, as you will see. Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of Yahweh. But look at this. According to all that David, his father, had done. How long did Hezekiah reign? What? 29 years. And whose footsteps did Hezekiah walk in? Oh, this is different, right? You see that? Up, up until then, it was kind of like, this guy was good because he followed his godly father's example. But notice this, Hezekiah is different even from the good kings that we've seen. Why? Because he follows the example of David. He is a much better king than all of the others. There's, there's like this, this pattern that you see in Chronicles and Kings, like, who are you following? Who are you following? And, and Hezekiah is, is a really good king because... He follows after the pattern of his great-great-great-great-grandfather, David, of course. But then this, of course, leads us to Manasseh. Turn back. Notice all the pages that are devoted to Hezekiah and all of the reforms that he did. But this leads us to 
Manasseh. Manasseh, 2 Chronicles 33, 1 through 2 says this, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned how long? 55 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, according to the abominations of the nations whom Yahweh dispossessed before the sons of Israel. Notice here, notice here, we, we, we are almost surprised by his evilness. He is the worst king in Judah, but notice, he doesn't reign as long as we think he's going to reign. He reigns for 55 years. He is the longest reign in all of Judean history. This doesn't make sense because he was a very wicked king. How wicked? He follows not just after his wicked fathers or his grandfather, not after the kings of Israel or Ahab. No, he's patterning, patter, uh, patterning his life after the nations who were dispossessed before Israel. Remember the book of Joshua? He, he is saying, now those nations, they probably had it together. I know, I know they were dispossessed. <laughs> but uh, it's, I want to follow them. I want to follow their gods. And, I mean, first off, that just seems so foolish, doesn't it? Why would you follow uh, the gods of peoples that were wiped out years uh, centuries before you. He is the worst, but it, he also enjoys this unusually long life that makes us uncomfortable. This doesn't fit into our biblical categories that we have been programmed to think are going to happen, right? But, but let's go into this a little bit more. He, he becomes kind of the new worst king ever. You see in 2 Kings 23, 26, you don't have to turn there, that despite Josiah's reforms, his grandson, despite Josiah's reforms, God is still angry at Judah because of Manasseh. And uh, during the last days of uh, Judah with another wicked king, this wicked king in 2 Kings 24 pales in comparison to Manasseh. I'll read this little quote here. 2 Kings 24, 3 uh, through 4. Surely at the command of Yahweh it came to Judah, that is, all these raiding parties that were attacking them, to remove them from his presence because of the sins of not the current king, but the king Manasseh, according to all that he had done, and all the innocent blood which he had shed for He had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and Yahweh was not willing to pardon. Uh, Manasseh becomes the new evil, the new golden standard of wickedness, and Judah can't even get out from under the burden of the blood and the guilt that he spills in Jerusalem. Matter of fact, you see this in 2 Chronicles 33, our chapter, uh, 22. Notice, just right at the end of our chapter, he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, this is his son, Amon, as Manasseh his father had done, and Amon sacrificed to all the graven images which his father Manasseh had made, and he served them. Manasseh essentially becomes the new yardstick of evil, right? When you follow in the pattern of wickedness, you're not following Ahab anymore. You're following the Ahab of the south. You're following Manasseh. And even Jeremiah, the prophet, in Jeremiah 15, basically says... To Israel, to, to those that are about to go into captivity. Listen, your sin is so great that God cannot not judge you. Even if Moses or Samuel were to pray for your intercession, the Lord would not pardon your sin because of Manasseh. That is what Jeremiah says. This guy, this guy has achieved a new level of evil and wickedness. And just to kind of set it up for you like that, let's, let's just read chapter 33, 1 through 10, and I want you guys to take some observations and try to, try, to, try to see how bad he really was. So look for illustrations of Manasseh's wickedness, and then I'll have you share them, and then we'll kind of talk about it together. So here we go. Um, Second Chronicles 33... And we'll start in verse 3. Illustrations of Manasseh's wickedness. Here we go. 
Indeed, he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had torn down. And he erected altars for the Baals and made Asherim and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of Yahweh, of which Yahweh had said, In Jerusalem my name shall be forever. Indeed, he built altars for all the host of heaven to the, in the two courts of the house of Yahweh. He even made his sons pass through the fire in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. And he practiced soothsaying, Interpreted omens, practiced sorcery, and dealt with mediums and spiritists, and did, he did much that was evil in the sight of Yahweh, provoking him to anger. Uh, then he put the graven image of the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever, and I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have set up for your fathers, if only they will be careful to do all that I have commanded them according to all the law, the statutes and the judgments given by the hand of Moses. Thus Manasseh led Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem astray in order to do more evil, more evil, than the nations whom Yahweh destroyed before the sons of Israel. Then Yahweh spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. They paid no attention. So what are the illustrations of Manasseh's evil? The, the writers just stacking them, uh, stacking them up for us to pick from. But what did you see first? What, what, what is an illustration of his evil? Yes, Isaac. Defiling the temple. Defiling the temple. And I, I, I would summarize this as kind of like, uh, this is a rejection, right? A passionate rejection of spiritual privilege and opportunity and heritage. Notice the verses that are being quoted here, right? Uh, this, I will put my name in this house forever. I, I, because I will be in your midst, Israel, you will no longer be, 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 be insecure, uh, back over to 33, verse 7, uh, uh, verse 8. And I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have set. Right, Because my name is among you, Israel, because you have access to the one true God, and I have chosen to make myself known. That's what it means to put your name among them, right? I am making myself known through the law and through the temple and through the sacrifices because I am with you. You never have to fear being scattered again. Only if what? You keep my commandments. You keep my commandments. All of this privilege, all of these promises from God, he is rejecting. And think about it this way. I I know he was pretty young when he became king, but it's possible that he was around when Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came down and threatened Jerusalem and Hezekiah, that he would wipe them out. And it is possible that Manasseh maybe even was around, maybe seven or six years old, when the angel of the Lord single-handedly wiped out 185,000 of the Assyrians who were threatening to destroy Jerusalem. Manasseh knew about the power of our God, at least from the testimony of his father, but he chose to reject that. He, cho- he chose to say, I don't care about the name of the Lord being among us. I don't care about the promises of God in his word. I don't care about the track record of this God throughout all of the history of Of our nation, I don't care about spiritual privilege. I'm rejecting it. And you can even see there's kind of like a, it's not just a blind ignorance that he's following after these gods. Doesn't it kind of feel like he's intentionally rebelling? Like he can't get far enough away from Yahweh? Like he hates Yahweh? That seems to be the the tenacity of his rejection. So yes, he rejected spiritual privilege. What else do we see? He he set up the the image. There's, There's more, there's more, there's more. What else do you see? Yes, Addie. Yes, he erected the ashram. You see, he erects all sorts of things. Uh, He rebuilt, verse 3, he rebuilt the high places. Notice this, that his father, Hezekiah, had torn down. He erected the altars to the Baals and made ashram and worshipped all the hosts of heaven. I would describe it this way. He he brought a counter-reformation like there was ever a counter-reformation. Because you actually see, not so much in Chronicles, but in 2 Kings 18, Hezekiah's mark on history was that he did the exact opposite of these things. He tore down the high places. He tore down the altars. He tore down the ashram. He cast all of that aside, right? He did this great reformation. One of the marks 
of Hezekiah's reign in Chronicles is that he was the one to open the temple doors. The temple doors had been um, bolted shut or locked shut, and, and Hezekiah opened up the temple and reformed the worship of Israel. But Manasseh, he's the one leading the counter-reformation. I was just learning from church history about the counter-reformation of the, the Catholic Church during the time of Reformation under the Jesu- Jesuit p- priests, and they, they, they did this vicious counter-attack on the Reformation, and you can be sure of it. Whenever, whenever the Lord is reforming his church, there's always a force being also equally inspired to counter-reform the church because, once again, the enemy of your souls likes you to stay in spiritual darkness especially if that spiritual darkness has the cloaks of religion on it. But, but notice this. He, he's just rebuilding all of these things. And, and notice the language, right? He rebuilt the very things that his father had torn down. Okay, what else? What else? He, he, he rejected spiritual privilege. He, he brought a counter-reformation. Yes, Brooklyn. Oh, Drew. Go ahead, Drew. Oh, okay, fine. All right, Brooklyn. Um, he practiced and Yeah, and, and this is... This, once again, just I would describe this as he pursued every power that he could conceive of, right? Uh, the question is, why would you go after all of this witchcraft, uh, interpreting omens? Why would you want to do all of these things? To, to, to interpret it very quickly for you, why would you do this? Because all of these things bring control into your life, right? Oh, by worshiping these idols even, it brings control into your life. By pursuing witchcraft, omens, mediums, spiritists, soothsaying, sorcery, all of these are actions that are tempting because, hey, through this, I don't have to count on God's word anymore. I can take control of something and do it myself. And that's kind of what he did. And notice how desperately he pursued control in his world. Now, politically, you could talk about how crazy the Middle East was at this point. And so who wouldn't want control? And maybe perhaps that's what we see all around us today. We see a a crazy world where people are desperately looking for control. We're not very far from Manasseh, but he pursued every single power that he could find. What else? What else do we see? Drew, did you have a different one? Yeah, this is perhaps one of the the most horrifying parts. Verse 6a, he sacrificed his son to Moloch in this area just south of Jerusalem that is said to be also the trash pit now, but it was it was formerly a place where this bull shaped um, idol would be stationed, and in the bull's belly would be a raging furnace that you'd throw your firstborn or children into in a way to express to the god how passionately you wanted to serve them. Once again, but this is a, this is a, this is a, an effort to control the God, right? The God will bless me because you'll see how passionately I'm ready to serve him. I'm even ready to sacrifice and serve someone from my very own house and my firstborn son himself in order to gain the favor of this God. What else? What else do we see about him? Yes, Isaac? Yeah, he rejected prophets. Now, once again, the people of Israel probably were going their own way, but once again, he rejected the prophets. You see there in verse 10, matter of fact, 2 Kings 21, 11 through 15, we won't read it, but gives this long uh, record of the very message of this prophet himself. You have rejected me, therefore I have rejected you, says the Lord. I'm going to do a thing in Jerusalem that's going to cause those who hear it to have tingling ears. And you can be sure that I will do it, right? He, but he rejected even the warnings of the prophets. He did not humble himself under the very word of God. What else do we see? What else do we see? Yes? He went against the word of God. In, mm-hmm. in verse 8, you see, um, he, God says, I will not again remove the foot of Israel. If mm-hmm. only they will be careful to do all mm-hmm. that I have commanded them. And, yeah. and Manasseh kind of did the exact opposite. Yeah, yeah. If that wasn't good enough. The word of God wasn't good enough. The word of God doesn't, con- I, I can't count on it enough. I, I can't control my situation with the word of God. I have to hope by faith in what God says. Uh, the, but the prophets weren't good enough. He said, I'm not going to choose that path 
for stability, I'm going to choose my own path, right? He ignored the prophets. Um, so, yeah, here, here's our list for us, right? He brought Israel to a new depth of evil, and I put ear, new in, like, scare quotes because it's really just following the nations uh, that the Lord dispossessed before them. But notice even verse 9, he did more evil than those nations. So this is a total new depth of evil. And by the way, what does that mean in justice terms? What must the Lord do? If you, if you start mimicking the practices of the nations that the Lord dispossessed out of the land because of their evil, what's God going to do? He has to dispossess you, otherwise he's not a just God, right? So right there, the writing's on the wall for his kingdom. As soon as you start following the practices of the nations that the Lord has dispossessed, you're done. He brought a counter-reformation. He rejected his spiritual heritage. He worshipped he worshipped uh, the creature over the creator. You see him worshipping the whole host of heaven. Matter of fact, you see uh, probably references to this in the book of Isaiah, or Isaiah, who says in Isaiah 45, 18, thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it, create a formless place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am Yahweh and there is no one else. But here Manasseh is searching after the cre- uh, creation over the creator. He he sacrificed his own children. He pursued every power that he could find. He rejected the prophets. And, of course, he received an accelerated punishment. That's how evil he was. Notice, he was judged. This is, this is when you know someone's evil, right? When God judges him. In verse 11, Therefore Yahweh brought the commanders of the army of the king, notice this, of Assyria against them, and they captured Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze chains and took him, notice where? Not to Assyria, but to Babylon. Now, quick little history uh, uh, interpretation here. Uh, We don't exactly know when this was, but we do know that the Assyrians did this. They put hooks in the noses of their enemies. Why? I was going to have this great slideshow for this very moment because they're actually um, ancient... uh, writings on stone you know, of, of, of the, the commanders of Assyria putting hooks in, in their uh, captives. And I thought you girls would really like that. Uh, but, but also, why do we put hooks in the noses of things? You can control really large creatures with hooks in their noses because they're very sensitive there. And this is probably a sign of subjugation, right? Apparently, Manasseh was a rebel against Assyria. And this doesn't make sense because when you read in the historical record, you see all throughout uh, Manasseh's reign, he was paying tribute to the kings of Assyria. So what's happening here? Well, some historians speculate that there was this time near the end of Manasseh's reign when the, the kingdom of Babylon revolted against Assyria and was crushed. And so there's speculation there that then was when Assyria took over Babylon and, and, and gained control of Babylon and they also retaliated against every nation that joined in Babylon's revolt. Maybe Judah joined with Babylon, not so much because they liked Babylon as much as they didn't like Assyria, and they wanted to weaken Assyria. And because of that, the king of Assyria took Manasseh and put him in chains, kind of like to show everyone else. This is what, you do. This is what happens when you rebel against me. I bring you by the nose to Babylon itself. And notice this, he receives a accelerated exile years before the, uh, the nation of Judah and Jerusalem would themselves be exiled into Babylon itself. He's almost a picture of the sin of Israel and where it's taking you. You know that this sin is going to take you to Babylon? That is what Manasseh is meant to be. So, there you go. That's the life of Manasseh. What do we do with that? What are the lessons that we learn from Manasseh? Believe it or not, that was all introduction for the next 10 minutes in which I'm going to share five lessons to learn from the life of Manasseh. And I'll try to be uh, zippity doo da day quick on this. Uh, first off, note this about Manasseh. Great light can produce even greater rebellion. Great light can produce greater rebellion. Light meaning truth, light meaning grace, light meaning heritage. Light meaning parents that are godly, that are seeking to live a reformed life, 
uh, that light in your life doesn't automatically mean you're going to be good. It can produce even greater rebellion. He apparently, he had to, set himself in his heart to do evil from a very early age. Can you imagine what's going through the heart of Manasseh at age 12 when he begins to reign alongside his father and then for the next 10 years reigns alongside his father and he begins to taste power and apparently taste lust for idols and control and decides to reject God at a very early age saying, I'm going to do it a different way. I've seen how my dad rules and it's unstable. This this God of Israel, this Yahweh God, does not serve me like I want him to serve me. I am going to follow my own way. But I don't think it should be so shocking to us, right? Sometimes we read the list of kings and we're like, how could you? How could you, Manasseh, have a father like Hezekiah and reject and reject everything that he has to tell you? I actually think it shouldn't be so shocking when great rebellion comes from great light. What should be shocking to us is when, when obedience and delight and trust and faith happens at all. That should be shocking to us. We see here the absolute need of the Spirit of God to truly change the heart of man. Man naturally is in sin and naturally does not like to come to the light. They embrace their sins. Your heart will either be humbled by the word of God and the light that it brings into your life, or you will be increasingly inoculated to truth and get so used to it that you become fervent in your rebellion. And that should cause you to worry because you can go to great lengths of rebellion because of great light in your life. But that's a second lesson that that brings us to. Greater rebellion doesn't always lead to a shorter life. Now here is where we are tempted to be uncomfortable. We want it to be clean and easy. We want to see that sin leads to short lives. Proverbs 10, 27 is wisdom for us, but it's not always true. The fear of Yahweh prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. That's what should happen in the life that God has created. But notice that doesn't always happen. You can live a long life in sin. You can get a lot out of this life without God. Now, now what does that mean for you? No, just just to, to build on it, Manasseh's captivity probably came within the last 10 years of his life. So most of his reign was in wickedness and evil and in shedding much innocent blood. But here's, here's a suggestion for this, right? Rebellion, a greater rebellion doesn't always lead to a shorter life. Maybe a long life. Maybe wicked rulers is a form of God's judgment, right? It is increasingly solidifying God's judgment in you or over you. And this should cause us to fear. Rejecting God's word sometimes, yes, makes life easier in the short run. In in this side of life, right? Rejecting God and his word can make life seem easier. And maybe even you can point to examples of people that seem to have a long and happy life and reject God's word. But don't be fooled. Just because your life is long does not mean that God's judgment isn't on display in that life. But that leads to a third application from the life of Manasseh. Longer life will still not escape God's discipline. Longer life will still not escape God, in other words. Manasseh, as I said, was taken captive and made an exile into Babylon And in this way, God seems to be giving Judah a preview of coming attractions. If you continue to do this, I will do this to you. So sometimes discipline is useful to us as a warning, right? Uh, This this is is an example, right? That, That regardless of how long you live in your sin, God will ultimately get you and judge you for your sin. I appreciate Numbers 32, 23, which says, but if you if you do this, behold. You have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. But here's here's a message. Sometimes discipline in itself can be a privilege, though. It can be a great grace and a privilege if God is using that discipline to warn you of a greater discipline, right? I'm I'm going to discipline you now so that I don't judge you later. 
So I do not discipline you for your sin. I'm going to discipline you now, and that is a sign of God's high privilege because he's actually trying to get your attention. I, I like the, the end of James for this reason. Remember, there's people that are sick. There, there are people that are suffering. There are people that are weak. And it seems as though God wants them to be in those places so that they will repent, right? A longer life will still not escape God's discipline. It might be God's discipline in and of itself. But this leads us to our fourth point, God's discipline is meant to lead you to repentance. God disciplines his people, and this is helpful to us, to lead them to repentance. God brings them to Babylon so that they can humble their heart and say, what a fool I have been. My greatest enemy is not the nations around me, but God, very God himself, Yahweh the Lord. Now look at this. This is a part of Manasseh's story that always amazes me. Chapter 33, verse 11. Therefore Yahweh brought the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria against them, and they captured Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze chains, and took him to Babylon. And when he was in distress, he entreated Yahweh his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. Then he prayed to him. And notice the capital. And he, Yahweh, was moved by his entreaty and heard his supplication And returned him back to Jerusalem, to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that Yahweh was God. Afterwards, he built the outer wall of the city of David on the west side of Gihon, in the valley. Even to the entrance of the fish gate. And he encircled uh, Ophel with it and made it very high. Then he put military commanders in all the fortified cities of Jerusalem. He also removed the foreign gods and the idols from the house of Yahweh. As well as all the altars which he had built on the mountain of the house of Yahweh in, in, and in Jerusalem. And he threw them outside the city. And he set up the altar of Yahweh and sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings on it. And he said for Judah to serve Yahweh, the God of Israel. But then notice verse 17. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed in the high places, although only to Yahweh, their God. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh, even his prayer to his God and the words of the seer who spoke to him in the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel, behold, they are among the chronicles of the kings of Israel. He, his prayer also, and how God entre- was entreated by him and all his sins, his unfaithfulness and the sites on which he built high places and erected the ashram and the graven images before he humbled himself, behold, they are written in the chronicles of the Hosai. And Manasseh slept with his fathers, and they buried him in his own house. And Amon, his son, became king in his place. Once again, even even summing up the reformation of his life, it still is evident that sin was the thing that characterized most of his life. He was the chief of sinners, you could say. In, In summing up his life, 1 Kings even says, now if you want to read more about Manasseh, and the sins that he sinned, that's, that's just what they say, because he was just known as a sinner. But, but notice here, God brings Manasseh to repentance and reformation through discipline. Yeah, you, know, you probably didn't have this on your Manasseh, you know, a bingo card, but this is also true of the life of Manasseh. He is a great illustration of repentance, In its remarkable verse 13, God is moved by the self-humbling of someone as wicked as Manasseh and even responds. And you, you could think this, God is always moved towards us when we humble ourselves before him, right? So the question for you today is, are you going to be humbled or humble yourself? Which one is it? Are you going to humble yourself under the word of God and the weight of God's presence in your life, or are you going to be humbled? Either way, either way, the Lord will cause the words to come out of your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, either in humbled judgment or humbled glorification. But notice this, God humbles us, God disciplines us to bring us to repentance. Choose this day how you're going to be humbled. It's going to be either or, but this leads us to our third and final application. True repentance isn't all, always able to change everything. True repentance isn't always able to change everything, but it still repents. True repentance isn't always able to change everything, 
but it still repents. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> Manasseh, by his repentance, could not escape the judgment coming, or could not cause Jerusalem to escape the judgment coming on them for all of their sins. Manasseh, by his reforms, couldn't cause Israel or J- Jerusalem or Judea to turn back to God in true repentance. Notice, even their obedience is, is half-hearted and not really according to the law. They're still worshiping on the mountain tops. But notice, probably the, the evidence that Manasseh's repentance is true is that he still repents anyway, right? This is not going to actually change anything, but it has changed my posture personally towards the Lord my God. Even if I can't escape all of the consequences for my sin, I'm still repenting because my greatest enemy is no longer the nations around me that are trying to take control from me and I'm trying to maintain control through, but my greatest enemy is actually God himself, and I dare not fight against the God of the universe, the creator in the heavens and the earth. Once again, first King, or Second Kings doesn't really talk about the repentance of Manasseh, so some people speculate if this is actually historical, and I would suggest it is, but Kings doesn't make a mention of it because the repentance of Manasseh was so late in his life that it was inconsequential to the judgment coming on Jerusalem. But that didn't change the fact that it was true inside Manasseh. And this is true repentance, right? It doesn't matter what the consequences are. I'm repenting. I'm turning back to God. This is the true tense, trust, right? Even if it only matters to you, even if it only transforms you, even if it doesn't actually change any of the consequences of your sin, are you still repenting? That's true and lasting repentance. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, thank you for this word. Help this passage to sink into our hearts and to our minds to cause fresh sobriety um, against sin, but also truer delight in you. You are the God whose word stands, and we can rest in that and trust in that. And even in our repentance, we can rest and trust in your willingness to come and gather us back again. Amen.